All right, for those who are joining now, we're just gonna give it a few minutes for, for anyone else to join and then we'll get started. But welcome, welcome to our Earthwatch Teacher Alumni Webinar Series. So I think I'll, I'll get started. Um, we are, I just want to start by noting we are recording this webinar. Um, so if you're watching and you know of other teachers and alumni, whether they're alumni or whether they're just other teachers that you think would enjoy this recording, uh, we will be making it available to all of you afterwards and encourage you to share with anyone you think might appreciate just what, what we'll have to share with you today. Um, other than that, just some housekeeping. Um, so to note that we have disabled the chat, so we're going to streamline communications through the Q&A. So I encourage you just throughout the webinar to submit any questions that you might have, and you can submit them at any time. And then we have my colleague, Sarah Wishart, who's handling the tech for the webinar today. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and she, at the end of this session, is going to just take a look at that Q&A box, and we'll go through as many questions as we have time for together. Uh, along those lines as well, if you have issues, questions with tech, you can submit them through the Q&A as well and Sarah can maybe connect with you uh, and just see what we can do to address that. But with that, I can go ahead now and just start by introducing myself. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Dana Solomon. I am a program manager here at Earthwatch Institute. I've been working in our program delivery department for almost six years now. And really in our educator fellowships is what I work on right now. So working on Project Kindle and Teach Earth, those are our two big fellowships for teachers. And you know, I've before coming into this role, I was a teacher myself, so really, really just absolutely love being able to connect and continue to work with teachers all throughout the US and engaging them with Earthwatch and our Earthwatch mission. I just see so much value in whether it's bringing teachers out or students out and just immersing them in this hands on learning and working side by side with these scientists studying big environmental issues um, just throughout the world. So that's actually how I met my co-presenter for today, um, Ben Caravaggio, and he'll be introducing himself momentarily. Um, but we basically, we started working together back in maybe 2017 when I was coordinating projects and Ben was just getting ready to bring his very first school group team out. Um, so he was going to be fielding on a project I was coordinating. And then since then, we have just had quite an array of different programs and interactions between Earthwatch and his school and his students. And I just got to see the amazing things over that time frame that he has just done for his students and the ways that he's taken the variety of Earthwatch experiences that he's had and brought that into his curriculum, brought his students out into the field. I mean, I get inspired by it. And so I really wanted for him to have a chance to share some of what he's done with, with others. And so that you can just get some ideas, see the ways that he's done it, that maybe you can find something similar or just that inspiration that you need to do the same for your own students and schools. So this is a presentation, we are calling it more than just a moment because the idea here is 
about taking those experiences that you might have had with Earthwatch and leveraging it into engaging and working with your students and just giving them all the more of an incredible experience with environmental science and ways that they might take that into their their own learnings and whatever they might want to do um, beyond the classroom and in their futures. So with that, I will now hand things off to Ben. We're basically going to be co-presenting, so we'll come in and out throughout the, the webinar. But um, with that, Ben, off to you. Thank you so much, Dana. Yeah, thank you for, for that introduction. I'm so humbled. Um, so yeah, um, I um, in this webinar, we are the objective is to give you an opportunity to either think about designing resources or lessons for your students based on whatever Earthwatch experience or expedition that you may have had. May that be Project Kindle, Teach Earth, or an expedition group. Um, and so we just want to quickly give, just give you guys an opportunity to like, you know, share my story and to also um, see some examples of the ways that we can implement some strategies for your own classroom. And so I'm going to go a, a little bit quickly um, through my introduction of who I am and my experience, and then go through some of the programs with Dana, um, some exciting opportunities to get involved either for your first time or to come back and to design a, um, a, a program for your students or to a strategy set how to get your, um, your first group out there. And then maybe even some thinking about some activities that you can use following a five-step model that you could really implement in whatever setting um, you have and whatever experience that you may have had. We're gonna go through an opportunity at Earthwatch at School, which is a pretty new initiative my experience with that, and also some resources of a project using iNaturalist. And um, again, these resources will be given out to you so you can implement them the way you want, adapt them for your students. If you're a middle school student, uh, teacher, an elementary school teacher, a high school teacher, you can adapt them the way you want, and then go through some challenges, some common challenges that we all face um, when we try to get groups out into the field. So a little bit of an introduction of who I am. I am a New York City licensed seven to 12 biology teacher. I've had 15 years of experience, which is kind of crazy to think about, but um, it's been in, in multiple settings, uh, mainly in the DOE. I spent six years in the DOE and about 10 years in a charter school, in a community grassroots charter school. Uh, the school that I'm currently at is a Title I school in East Harlem which has varying, uh, varying populations, um, pretty typical for in your city school, but um, we have a 36% IEP student uh, population and 16% ENL population. And so our school is a CTT model school. So we have, for most of our core content areas, we have a general science teacher and a special education teacher, which is a very important uh, model and a very unique model, I think, that doesn't happen in many different settings. Um, as part of my experience, I've also been an at-risk program coordinator where I've had kids that are underage and over, uh, uh, overage and undercredited, um, trying to get them caught up and graduated on time. But also I've taught classes like AP Bio, Living Environment, and a variety of biology electives as part of my, my time there. So just like Dana was saying, of my first involvement was with Project Kindle back in 2016, um, where I got introduced with Earthwatch. I got an email in my inbox and I was like, what is this? What kind of opportunity? There? It's like a PD, a professional development opportunity in much in crazy location. Grant came and I was like, wait, what? What is this? So I, I was, um, after talking to a variety of Earthwatch staff members, I saw this as a unique opportunity to realize one of my dreams, which was to get kids out into the field, to have an opportunity to design um, a field excursion expedition with students. And with Project Kindle, it was an opportunity to uh, create a think tank with other like-minded teachers to strategize how to get students out into the field and how to make this a reality. In 2017 was my first group um, where I, that's where I met Dana, uh, where we, we worked on logistics and we got a group of, I think it was six students at the time, um, out into the field. 
And then in 2018 and 2019, we continually grew and grew our, 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 um, our cohort size. And we had multiple locations in the same, with the, within the same expedition. In 2020, um, we'll talk more about this, but we went through, I uh, had an opportunity to, um, to work with Dana again as a co-facilitator in Earthwatch at School, which was a great opportunity um, during a unique set of circumstances. We'll talk about that. And then now we're excited that in 2022, we have um, another expedition on the books, this time in Utah, still working with pollinators, which um, we're really, really excited about. So Dana is gonna talk a little bit more about Project Kindle, where it all started for me. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to take a few minutes here for those that might not have heard of this fellowship program or are curious to learn more. Um, but as I mentioned, we offer two different fellowships here at Earthwatch, and one of them, and these being for teachers, and this one is Project Kindle, which it's open to high school teachers of any subject within the United States. Uh, those are the candidates we are currently seeking. And the idea of here being, if you are a teacher who you know, maybe your school offers some trips, some different field trips in art and language, but maybe they're missing that science sort of trip and that's something you're looking to add. Or maybe you've just always wanted, you really want to get your students out of the classroom, immersed in this hands-on environmental science learning, and you're just not sure how to go about it. You know, there's certain challenges and how to overcome them. Well, this is a fellowship for you because this is where, you, as the first step, would go out on an Earthwatch expedition of about seven to 12 days in length with a team of teachers that are all in the same boat, all looking to learn how to make this happen for your students. And while you're doing that standard expedition experience, you'll also have in the evenings or maybe mornings, whenever it fits in with the research, um, you'll have some workshops. And these are gonna be led by two facilitators one of whom will be a member of the Earthwatch team that works with getting, getting school group teams ready to go and prepared. And the other is gonna be an alumni to Project Kindle. So a teacher who went through this process and has then successfully brought their students out into the field on an expedition. And there's, these are gonna be workshops tackling a lot of those big questions and challenges that often come up when you are trying to bring your students out. So whether it's the logistics to make it happen or fundraising to make sure that anyone can, can join from the school that wants to programming needs for student preparation and, and thinking about activities for the classroom as well. So there's quite a bit that goes into these different workshops with the goal being that after you've participated on that team, you're then gonna be ready to start working towards bringing your students out within the next couple of years on an Earthwatch expedition with you. Um, so really exciting is we actually, I think it's it's been maybe a week since we've launched our Project Kindle 2022 application. So it is now open. You can learn more. There's the web page at the bottom here. I encourage you to check it out to learn more about the fellowship. You'll find the application link to apply. You also see here the fellowship awards at earthwatch.org. So you're, I encourage you to email with questions. We've got our program coordinator that will be monitoring that inbox and just helping to answer any and all questions you might have about the process. Um, but that's how Ben got his foot in the door. And so with that, Ben, if you want to just talk a little bit more about your own experience. Yeah, um, so, oh, let me go back. So my experience, um, again, it was phenomenal. Doing something I never thought it would be um, possible, which was, for me, uh, it was part of the, the initial cohort, right? Dana, we were the, yeah. I was the first initial cohort. For the this very cohort. first, yeah. <laughs> um, so for us, it was, it was, interesting because the expedition was to um, monitor endangered coral in Little Cayman. Um, and it was an example of a typical student expedition where we had to ID multiple um, uh, species of coral underwater, collect data underwater with our partner, uh, basically snorkel every single day for um, two times a day out and then in the afternoons, have an opportunity to workshop with each other with these big ideas and uh, these big questions that Dana had just mentioned. What was I found to be like my biggest takeaway was 
I mean, I was literally introduced to an organization that, what I guess, like I said, was a direct pathway to getting kids out into the field, experiencing, um, you know, the day in the life of a research scientist, collecting data alongside the scientists, and it was, you know, a great example. But for me, I was, I was kind of concerned of like, how am I going to get kids out here? What is these are some, you know, skills that my students are going to need to have. But, you know, finding the right expedition that I would focus my students, my, my efforts on was my biggest task here. Like after looking at all the different arrays of, of expeditions that, that Earthwatch offers, we had to really think about which one would be the, the, the right one. And so in this opportunity, looking, um, working with teachers from a variety of different uh, backgrounds, private school, charter school, DOE schools, it was a great um, think tank of networking of different um, New York City teachers that came together to really workshop and strategize um, how we could make this happen in our unique settings. And that was the biggest takeaway for me. I, I was introduced with multiple teachers that I later then collaborated with in our fundraising efforts. And we both got to take our students out, which was a great um, opportunity that wouldn't have ar arisen if I was not um, involved in, in the Project Kindle, which I thought was uh, uh, great. But after coming back from this, I was so uh, invigorated that I wanted to really go out into the field and go out there, guns blazing, get a group, student group out there. And I really had to take a moment to really think about intentional programming. I think this is where a lot of us, uh, well, people like me, who get so passionate about something, go, 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 go. And I really had to take a step back and think about, well, wait, if I really wanna make this a long lasting program or an experience that happens in my school over the years, I really need to be intentional and think about the long-term plan, right? And so that's where I started thinking about how do I create a three to five year program with this expedition in mind that then becomes a lot lasting um, impact on my students and a hallmark of the school. And that's where we had to sit down, me and uh, my co-facilitator, and think about a proposal for implementation. Um, we had to be intentional in our programming. We had to get our stakeholders all involved. And again, this all came up with from, you know, these workshops that we thought when we, when we participated in Project Kindle, we had to get buy-in from administrators, department chairs, guidance counselors were involved, parent coordinators were involved. And out of this conversation, we realized we could design the content specifically for one of these expeditions as an elective course. Now, again, that model fit my school, my situation, but this also could fit as a high school, uh, in the high school curriculum, as part of um, your living environment course or your AP course, right? But you really have to think about purposeful design and purposeful implementation. One of the things that was important for us was equitable access for all our students, right? We didn't want to just track this for the highest achieving students. We um, thought about a holistic, um, you know, having it holistically open for students to be able to um, apply at, uh, and, and tell us the reasons why they wanted to participate. And so we opened it up to a wide variety of students. And then from that, we thought about, well, what expedition would fit our needs? What expedition would we be comfortable uh, with our students being uh, participatory? And so I knew that anything underwater was not for me as a, as a first time uh, uh, facilitator. And so we thought about um, you know, different variables and what came about was the Conserving Bees in Costa Rica and other Paul Leaders project. And through that, we identified the skills that our students needed for this. And then we scaffolded the content for the classes to ensure the students had successful um, skills that they would be able to be experienced in this expedition. Um, we repeated the expedition uh, multiple of times um, throughout the years, and that ended up fostering a really strong relationship with our lead scientist that then um, was able to continue the implementation of that, um, that program. So those were like a lot of the things that we thought about 
as we were getting ready for these expeditions. All right, so on that note, you know, the next thing that comes into play from Project Kindle, naturally, you get that experience with other teachers, and then you work on prepping for a school group. So on this slide, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our school group programs and expeditions. Now, I do want to add here the note that, well, naturally, this is part of the Project Kindle process and expectation that you will, following that fellowship experience with the teachers, work on putting together a school group. By no means do you have to go through that process. So you might be a teacher that maybe you have some experience already or you, you feel like you already know the steps and you're just ready to jump right into making this happen for your students. In that case, you absolutely can. And so you'll see the contact information at the end of this page. So I put my colleague Lauren Bent's email address here. She is our school groups manager and is the one that is working with all teachers, including Ben right now, that are prepping for school groups in this coming year. And so she would be the one to really help you in that process of picking the right expedition for you and your students uh, and really making it happen. So you can also visit our, our website page specific to school groups to learn a bit more as well. Um, but what's this, what's the importance of a school group experience? Well, the fact is, you know, it's that opportunity to get your students out of the classroom and immersed in environmental science learning. So engaging them, you know, not only in in helping with these tasks, but they're, they're more than just tasks. It's meaningful science that's going into publications, going into real research that we are working on here at Earthwatch. And at the same time, they're getting to work side by side with our professional scientists. And so I think as a student, getting that experience can be just so inspiring. And they get to see what these scientists, what it's like to live that life. And really, really just through that experience, understand, is this something that I enjoy doing that I maybe want to strive towards that career path? Or just as important, it might be a time for them to realize, you know, this is cool, but maybe this isn't the career path for me. That is also an important question for them to figure out. And so just all the value that comes from being able to bring your students out with you. Um, the photo that I picked on this page is from when I was able to go out uh, and join a school group team and just seeing the students get to, you know, be out in nature, working with these scientists, learning from them, which is, it's, it's something else. Um, but, you know, all that to also note that it's an experience that looks great on a college application. And so whether it's the parents and guardians that like to hear that or the students as well, I'm sure, you know, it can only help in that sense as well. So Ben, I'm gonna hand it back to you to, to share a bit more there. Yeah, so just um, again, the, our school's um, experience, we worked with Dana um, to get three cohorts of students since 2017. And it, like I mentioned before, we chose one expedition that fit our needs based off of the physicality, the types of uh, activities, the content that specifically, which was looking at pollinators, looking at how an elevation gradient affects different communities of pollinators that are um, that are, be, are visible, how climate has affected these communities over time, and which shrubbery um, or which um, types of shrubs attract the most types of pollinators in order to uh, help agroforestry um, initiatives in, um, in Costa Rica. And again, we chose, I, a little selfishly, I chose Costa Rica because it was where I fell in love with field work in my own um, experience um, in undergrad and graduate school. And so I wanted my students to have that same experience and, and having them be out, you know, roughing it like under rainstorms and, you know, with intense heat, but actually getting them ex to experience a day in the life of a field ecologist, a field biologist. And so what was, what was important, what was tricky for me was that where in the school year do I actually hold this ex ex expedition? And what we found was that we would hold the summer space as a way for juniors, um, as a way to have this expedition that it would be a culmination of the course that they would experience. 
Uh, we chose juniors particularly because of the point that Dana said, it looks great on college applications. So when they come back from the field, they have an opportunity to write about for the college essays, for the college entrance um, you know, applications. And so the students ended up being part of this expedition um, based off of how they performed in the class. They had an elective course that we designed. That the elective course was designed based around AP content. And so, and again, equitable access for all. So we, and we, we really considered on a whole rubric, holistic scale, which students you know, would participate. And when they return, that was another uh, point that we could actually um, have them report out to the greater community um, their experience. So they held we held a student symposium where they talked to administrators, we talked to, to you know different parents and other students about what they learned in the field and how this experiential hands-on learning was so important to them, which then continued to get buy-in, which then continued to ensure that the program was successful for the next year, and in, saw um, it rate it rose um, it, interest it within other students. And so that was really, um, really purposeful and really strategic in the way that we um, had placed it. Oftentimes that summer placement is meant for remedial courses and not a lot of focus is given to those, those kids that really um, would thrive if they were given an, an enrichment activity beyond the classroom. And so again, post-expedition, I kind of talked about this a little bit, when we come back, now what, right? We had our, our trip, eight days out in the field, kids complaining about the variables, but then realizing, oh my God, that was such an amazing experience. Well, we wanted to leverage that enthusiasm to be able to then um, get them as seniors on being able to like, how are you gonna take this and, and, and move forward? How are you gonna own this experience? And so again, our school, uh, we do have a rooftop which had, um, you know, we have rooftop access and there's a gardening initiative that has been on and off throughout the years. Our students were so gung-ho about coming back and reliving, re uh, enriching this, um, this space. They created bulletin boards and PSAs for other students that, uh, about their experience, uh, complete with photos. They wanted to advocate for composting and climate action. Again, initiatives that happen in our school and our school lunchrooms, but no one really pays attention to. And then on the climate action, uh, the student walkout happened that same year. Our students were all about participating. They wanted to go out into the streets. Um, they wanted to protest because they got to see firsthand what was what was happening um, out in the field. And so they were able to um, create these different initiatives. Um, and, and, one, and one big initiative that surprised me was they wanted to create a like living classroom. And so we had an opportunity to work with New York City Sunworks um, and we created a lab proposal. The kids wanted to um, go to community board meetings and have this proposal to raise funds um, for this this um, living classroom. Now, again, these strategies are huge, right? These are like extends beyond, but you could really pare it down based off of your, um, based off of your experience, whether it be Teach Earth or, you know, your, your expedition and the following six real uh, easy steps to consider, design an activity that can take this experience and, implemented to your entire class, not just the small cohort of students that got to go into the field. So I invite you to consider these six different um, uh, steps as you think about playing an activity that extends beyond just the moment of being out in the field or being part of any of these amazing fellowships. So first, identify the content or the background of that expedition and make it grade level appropriate, right? Our specific content was around pollinators and around the variables that affect pollinator visits. And so we looked at things like time of day, we looked at, um, we identified, you know, very broadly the categories of different types of pollinators and why they were important. Then we presented the research question and gave students all the different variables that they could examine, right? And you just want to think about two or three different variables and break them up into smaller groups if you need to, about those variables that um, you considered out on your expedition. 
for us specifically, we were thinking about, well, does the type of habitat affect bee diversity? How does sun exposure affect pollinator abundance or diversity? Do some bee groups visit, um, you know, based off of human, um, human disturbed, humanly disturbed places? And so we presented those different lists of variables and students got to check, got to pick on which variable they wanted to examine. We did a little bit of a simulation of data collection. So this was during the springtime. And so students got to the chance to go outside and see which pollinators they would see that, that would be the most abundant. We actually are right across from Randall's Island. So we got to visit Randall's Island and just kind of explore a little bit. When we came back, we had a sim simulated data set that we gave to the students. Now, this was where that, that that fostering that relationship with that lead scientist, we were able to have a sample data set that the students have collected in the past. And so we provided this to the greater community, the, the greater class, and had them mine and look at the correlation between these variables. Um, the students then created charts. They, again, these were my, in my AP, in my advanced class, so they, they understood error of the mean, error bars, and they created data, um, data sets that examined the correlations between these variables and what they could statistically say with statistical um, significance. And how the students can make those conclusions and identify those biases. Again, this is meant for high school, but this could be pared down to an elementary school level or middle school level, depending on your students, but these six, steps really kind of make get you to think about how I can design this for my 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 students once I return back to the field with this amazing experience that um, I just we just you just had so again this was great while we were in the field right but we all know what just happened or what we're in the midst of we're in the midst of COVID and COVID ended up shutting down the plans for 2020 um and that was unfortunate at that point we thought oh my god what are we going to do with our earth watch group that was getting ready to go out for a fourth time you know what opportunities that they had they've been studying this for a whole semester and now we have you know we have to shut down and you know i we were really concerned at, at the at the future of our partnership with earth watch until Dana reached out and said, we have this amazing opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Yeah, no, it, I mean, COVID, the pandemic, it's hit all of us and Earthwatch is, is very much a part of that. Um, so yeah, we, as soon as we realized we were not able to safely get teams out in the field that our expeditions were going to have to go on pause, the wheels started turning. Well, what can we do to stick with our mission? And that's where we started going virtual with we have Earthwatch at school and Earthwatch at home. So this is our newly developed virtual curriculum. Uh, to date, we have developed one curriculum so far specific to climate change. And it is a four part course, you can see the four classes on the screen here so class one being an introduction to climate change class two is talking about climate changes impact on ecosystems and biodiversity class three being the socioeconomics of climate change and class four, you know, thinking well what happens next, what are some solutions and what are some actions that we can take at the individual level and bigger. And so that's where I mentioned, I believe, or at some point uh, noted that in addition to being a program manager, I'm also an environmental educator as I have been co-teaching these classes so far with some of our lead scientists from all over the world. Um, so that's what we knew that we needed to keep our, our Earthwatch participants connected with our scientists. That is what Earthwatch is about. And so we have had a guest scientist joining each of these classes from joining in from the Arctic to joining in from Mexico City to the Pyrenees, you name it. Um, so that in each class, the participants get a taste of a little bit of science around climate change from throughout the world. And we absolutely, you know, certainly it's not quite the same getting a hands-on learning experience from your home, but where we could make this an interactive curriculum, engaging, and just making sure that the students are really 
involved in what they're learning. Uh, we absolutely tried to make that happen. So it's run through Google Classroom. We've created a learning journal that complements the experience, including a lot of extra resources and activities to go beyond that, that class time together over a screen. Uh, and a big part of that as well is that we teach, we introduce and we teach the tool iNaturalist as part of this program. iNaturalist, which Ben will talk a little bit more about and the amazing things that he has done with it. Um, but iNaturalist, it's a citizen science, community science tool that you can download onto your phone as an application, or you can just find it on the web. And it's basically a, a, an ongoing huge data set of species uh, throughout the world that people have identified through photography and audio. There's also audio as well. So just capturing different species into this, this very large data set. Uh, and there's a lot of really cool ways that that data set can be used and that students can add to it, continue add to it. And so Earthwatch along those same lines also developed our Global Pollinator Watch, which is our newest expedition and this is one that unlike all of our other ones where you go out into the field to participate in the data research and all of that this is one that you can join from anywhere from home and so it's connected with iNaturalist and so these two combined have also just created a new space for teachers or for anyone that just wants to get involved in citizen science to use the iNaturalist tool and contribute to an Earthwatch project. So I think, I don't know, Ben, is there anything that I've missed that you want to add with regards to your experience with this, this program? And yeah. No, I think, uh, I think you've hit everything on the head, except for that you're an amazing co-teacher and co-facilitator. <laughs> um, it was great to have, I mean, again, we were all in this situation of in the virtual, you know, learning, um, you know, experiment that we've been in. Um, it was great as, as a teacher to have um, you and all the different um, uh, research scientists come in and help facilitate these conversations and still offer the opportunity for uh, my students to um, engage with professionals in the field to understand how climate change is affecting all these different areas and then to engage with a digital tool that they can go out and immediately implement and through that last um, that last section um, last session um, with the global pollinator watch the wheel started kind of thinking I was always I was always, try to find a new platform, a new digital platform to try to increase my engagement. That was the biggest struggle during that time is how do I engage my students in actively collecting data in a way where they can, they can go ahead and do it and do it in a fun way. And so that's when I was introduced to iNaturalist and then came up with our, you know, modified like different uh, uh, resources and, you know, implemented this end of the year iNaturalist project that I wanted to share with everyone so you can use it, implement it in, in the way that you see fit. Again, you can modify it down, pare it down to its basic um, its basic structures down to for an elementary school setting, a middle school setting, or in a high school setting. And I wanted to kind of you know share that out with everyone just to see as an example of what you can do um, in the event that um, you're not able to take students out into the field. So I began first, and again, we will share these uh, these resources a little bit later, um, but we began with an iNaturalist bingo project where students actually were uh, tasked with making observations using the iNaturalist app and looking for 25 of the most common plants and animals found in New York City in Central Park and the surrounding areas. And so the task was to try to create uh, research grade observations on the uh, iNaturalist website by capturing as much uh, data as possible, getting pictures that were clear enough um, and looking at, uh, at those pieces. So I wanted to share these out real quickly so you could see um, what exactly um, we're talking about here. So it was done again, all virtual and you can, ooh, my computer's a little bit slow. There we go. So I we chose 25 of the most common species. And so points were given for as many bingo uh, rows as they can make. 
we had observa- we had them record those iNaturalist observations, and we gave the students um, a rubric where they were able to understand understand um, exactly what they were looking for, right? So um, we provided the students with that rubric that got them to really think about those observations, the number of research grade observations. And then in conjunction with that, we had them participate in a project BioBlitz. Now, if you're not familiar with the website, I invite you to really explore the idea of creating a BioBlitz where students are giving a time frame in order to collect, um, collect observations. And so within this BioBlitz, they're able to go out, collect observations, post them up into the field, engage with other citizens um, that can identify and verify what are those um, species that they're, um, that, they're, that they're observing. So again, uh, within my class, 228 observations, 104 species, 99 different identifiers were created within a two week period here during um, the time that we implemented this. So from this, again, they had those observations, they engaged with um, different citizens for that species identification. We then had them create a virtual field guide where they were able to then say, well, in a, in, if we were out in a field trip, we want them to capture all this information, go back into the field guides and create what we all know to be a field journal. So we created a, a way, this is just an example of um, a field guide that students then engaged with and were able to uh, report out their pictures and findings of those different uh, species that they observed. Once they finished with that, they were then asked to then engage in a post-observation analysis. They had a whole data set here, 228 observations. So then I, we, we uh, required them to then think about, well, what number of taxes were being represented here? What were the most common species that they observed, all right? Um, what were some of the, um, the commonalities that they saw in the different types of birds and animals? They were asked to graph their data. And again, my computer's a little slow here, but again, these resources could be um, pared down to, the, to fit your needs depending on um, your students. So we asked them to calculate percentages, right, of their total observations. And again, these will all be provided at the end of our, um, our webinar. Um, so once they engaged with, they got familiar with the iNaturalist, I saw, I saw an increase in the students actually adding to this data set. They were starting to get competitive because in iNaturalist it shows who has the most observations who has the most species identified. And then we wanted to kind of wrap it back up to the, um, the um, initiatives that we had in our original expedition, which was that pollinator um, uh, topic. And so we used iNaturalist to have the students um, engage in uh, a biodiversity lab where they were exploring the biodiversity of what observations were the most common um, within the data set of iNaturalist worldwide and specifically in New York State. So they had to go in, it's almost like a web quest where they had to look at the different species um, that were most common and which ones were most common in New York City and why. So it kind of related back into the original mission of what we had in the expedition. So that was, a really cool way that we thought of um, engaging in, oops, sorry, engaging in that, in that same collecting observations experience. I'm trying uh, to get out of this. Uh, to do this share there mode. Let's present. There we go. We're back. Perfect. 
All right. Um, well, I see we, we've got about 15, 16 minutes till till the wrap up of the webinar. So Ben and I just wanted to take a few more minutes on this slide before we turn to the Q&A. Um, probably Ben, we probably have 10 minutes or so on this slide. Um, but to address challenges, because I think, you know, we just talked about a lot of amazing things that have come from Ben's experiences and I don't know, hearing it, I could think, wow, I, I, you know, how, how do I make that happen for my students? What about this factor that I have to think about or that factor? And that might be just, you know, pretty, pretty intimidating to think about and enough in some cases to just pause on something that that you really could achieve these sorts of final goals that we've seen here from Ben. And so kind of with that, I want to talk about these challenges, because the fact of the matter is, Ben definitely went through his fair share of them as well. And it's there are ways to get through them. And so I just wanted to take a few minutes to address some of the more common ones that that I've experienced in my years at Earthwatch and working with teachers and just hearing where these sorts of roadblock blocks might come into play. Um, but then also hearing from Ben as a teacher who has gone through a bunch of these roadblocks and gotten through them. Um, so the first one being fundraising. I know this can be quite a challenging process, especially, you know, depending on the amount that you might need to be fundraising, it can be daunting. Um, and I'm curious, Ben, because I know that this is something that you had to do with your school and just how that went, any thoughts, any ideas you want to share there? Yeah, so that was that's the biggest question um, that I have, you know, encountered when I talk about my experiences with Earthwatch. Um, and so fundraising, you just have to get creative and you really have to think about being strategic and try to, to have multiple streams um, and different initiatives that are that are happening concurrently. And so what I mean by that is that we have we have matching donations, we had scholarships, um, we worked within, uh, we had teachers reach into their networks and come up with, um, or different contacts of different companies that we could really get those matching donations if we fundraised um, a certain amount. Um, we were, our students were not expected to um, fund um, a large portion because our students are not able to, right? Um, we had them actually put down a deposit that then was returned back to them in field gear, which again, helped us logistically lock in the names of the students that we needed to have. But in terms of fundraising, we really had to get creative and we held multiple fundraisers of different kinds. One of the th ways that I thought was really great and we got a lot of support from, from Earthwatch was we connected with other teachers that were out in the field in Project Kindle and we collectively threw a fundraising event at a bar for adults, of course, <laughs> where 20% of the pro uh, proceeds were returned back to us um, from, the, from the bars like uh, pool. So we had, um, you know, a, a sponsoring location. And by collaborating with different teachers to hold this event, we were able to broaden our network of the items that we were going to offer during silent auction. Another really great strategy was the Bullathon, which sounds crazy, but it's actually the biggest bang for our buck because students got sponsored um, per pin that they thought that they would get, like, be able to knock down, right? And so they would collect pledges much like a March of Dimes or like an AIDS walk, where they collected um, pledges based off the number of pins that they would, um, or what their score would be. And in doing so, it actually, you know, it's a very low overhead cost and a maximum, um, you know, a bang for your buck when, when it came to collecting that. Again, uh, reaching out for those matching donations, those sponsorship opportunities, candy sales are always those constant things that are happening throughout again with these big um events throughout um the year that and again that started right from from the beginning of the school year we knew that we had a number to hit we had a solid budget plan with all these multiple streams that we 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 financed out and so we knew what numbers we needed to hit within those different strategies 
Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Ben. Uh, moving on to another big challenge that I have certainly seen time and time again, no pun intended, um, is, is time. Uh, teachers have busy schedules. And to do this on top of everything else that's on a teacher's plate, it's 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 a lot and there's a lot that goes into prepping for school groups for getting students out for building curriculum above and beyond what you're already doing whatever it might be time is a factor so ben i'm curious with everything that you have accomplished any any advice there um number one find a solid number two right find a solid number two like co uh facilitator that's going to be able to help um with those pieces when you're focusing on the big rocks there, right? And again, this is where a lot of, I really love Earthwatch because they really help with the logistics and the planning portion of getting students out of the field, making sure that parents are involved, being active in those parent meetings. I mean, I, you know, and Dana, you were, you were great at, at facilitating, helping facilitate one of those parent meetings and student meetings when the students had questions. Um, time, again, I, if you're very ambitious, try to, like, to come back from a expedition and then go and try to do a, uh, a school group within that same year is very ambitious. I would say take a solid you know, year to really plan out and do it for the following year. Um, put to, again, put together a team that, that is solid um, and come up with a realistic time frame, right? A timeline, seeing where it lies within your calendar, where you can realistically um, achieve that goal, give yourself time for the fundraising portion of it. And then, um, you know, once you get that, that rolling and then, you know, we'll, we'll start to run itself. Excellent. Next being administration buy-in. I know this was an area that, you know, once again, once it got going, it, it was really kind of natural, but it took you some time to get there. And I know that, that you're not the only teacher that has felt that way. And in fact, that can very much be an area that might pit a potential school group on pause indefinitely. And so I'm curious, you know, I know you did it successfully. Any advice there? Um, so when I first came back, like I said, I was gung-ho, we're doing this, we're going out in the field, it's so exciting, and I got no multiple times, no, no, no. And that's when I really had to come back and be like, okay, I need to identify why we're doing, the why, right? I need to make clear what are the benefits of this, not only on the student side and the school side of things, but also pedagogically, how this is leading to the development of teachers at the school, how this program or this expedition is cross-curricularly connected to other programs in our school. We had um, an SCP program, a software engineering program. We have a culinary arts program. And I was like, okay, I could sandwich myself in between here and say, look at the connections. We could have students program the sensors for these, like, you know, to like monitor the plants. And then when we grow the plants, we could do a farm to table. So I laid that out in a proposal and with a solid budget that I could not get no for an answer. It literally was like, you cannot give a no once you see it laid out, but it took that intentional planning and getting the stakeholders involved as much as possible. We had an external affairs um, person in our school, our department chair was really um, involved in the planning process. We had guidance counselor that were bought in. And so when you had that, those stakeholders and presented them with a solid plan, they could start to see that this, this program and this expedition that it, it far exceeded um, the problems that, that we were gonna face, but we could always strategize around them. Excellent. And last but certainly not least, I think we got a couple minutes left before I want to head into the Q&A. Student engagement. You know, you can do all of these other things successfully, but does it matter if your students aren't really into it? Mm, maybe not. So, Ben, what's your advice there? How have you made when that I, work? When I tell you, when I first told the kids that they were going to be going and collecting bees and butterflies, they're like, absolutely not. Oh, oh no, 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 no. And so, with the experience itself, um, you know, being being as 
engaging with them as, uh, as much as possible. And then having them have that switch where they were able to now go outside and they were just like looking at the at flowers and like looking at the it was it was great it was amazing so you see the benefits of the program itself kind of just manifesting in itself and using it as a carrot right using it as an opportunity to visit another country engage in in climate um in climate science um engage with a professional in the field um incorporate those independent um that that independence that as a junior they're like you know getting ready for that that uh transition was was important to me and and having them have that experience and be able to come back and report out to the rest that started catching on as wildfire that started causing a buzz within the school that students started to be like, okay, what's that program? I, I, I wanna go, like, what's, well, how can I get involved? So it kind of started to pace itself in, in a way that it kept on engaging other students. All right, well, thank you so much, Ben. Um, with that, one really quick reminder, if you are watching this recording, I know in a few slides ago, Ben was addressing all these amazing resources. Um, well, this goes for anyone who is watching live who registered, uh, we will make sure to send you those resources so you'll have access to them. Ben has kindly agreed to share them um, so you can implement them, adapt them as you see fit for your students. Um, but if you're watching the recording through the YouTube channel, it will be also linked in just the text area of that recording. So if you scroll down, you should be able to find the link to access these same tools. But with that, I'm gonna ask Sarah Wishart to join us because she's going to just go ahead and she's been monitoring that Q&A. Um, for those who, who might not have typed in questions at the start, um, just a reminder, you can add them to the Q&A bar, which depending on what sort of device you're on will be either the bottom, top, left or right of your screen. Um, but you can type those questions in and we've got a few minutes left to answer some of them. Yeah, we got a couple come in. Um, the first one is, do you choose your own expedition in Project Kindle? Ah, that is a great question. Um, I'm assuming it's in reference to the, the teacher team. So that first experience that you get when you're going out with other Kindle fellows, uh, those other teachers, in that case, you do not. It would be a, a pre-selected trip um, that you'll all be going on together. It just gets a little tricky because every teacher probably has a different idea of the trip they would want to go on. And so we, we go with one that is, you know, familiar that has hosted school group teams before. So you get a taste of what the experience might look like, um, but you're by no means tied into taking your students back out on that trip. You can absolutely think of some others. It's more just to give you the kind of full Earthwatch experience, because in that sense, you know, you're still going to be working side by side with scientists wherever you might be. Great, and now one other, which is probably for Ben. Um, did the expedition experience inspire any of your students to study the sciences in college or pursue a STEM career? That's a great question. I actually had, uh, I've had two, two or three students um, that were not considering um, being in the STEM fields and has now uh, pursued biology as a major. So because, uh, and, and wrote about this experience for their college essay. So yeah, gung ho about, about that. I'm really proud of those students that decided, I mean, there is a level of just an expansion and, and a level of engagement that you get out in the field where I had students that were not considering by no means being out in the field and actually enjoyed it to the point where they continue to engage with it post um, the, the expedition and post-secondary. So, yeah. Oh, I, I encourage a field expedition, you know, but above all things. I do. I love those stories. It's, it's moments like those that remind me why, why I do what I do. But uh, yeah, I think it, it really does there's just so much that that getting into the field 
can do for for you as a teacher or for your students or just everyone, honestly. To that point, like I feel like I have become a better instructor because of the experience that I've had with taking students out into the field and having, and a lot of, you get to see a whole different side of the students as well and, and engaging with them, you know, alongside the, the, the climate scientists as well. Like having that, being that bridge for students and having them see the possibilities are like just amazing. Well, on that note, I do see we're just about at time. Ben, huge thank you for, for taking time on top of planning for your school trip, on top of everything else um, to join us here, <laughs> <laughs> to share. I mean, yeah, every, every time I hear from you, I just feel a little bit more inspired. And so I really do appreciate um, you taking that time. It's always a pleasure. Um, just a few last words here. Again, a reminder that we'll be sharing the resources that Ben's talked about in this presentation with all of you. If you're watching the recording, you'll just scroll down to the text of the YouTube post and it should be there should be a link there to access them as well. Um, this is we, we are back up and running with our alumni webinar series, which is super exciting. We had a brief hiatus in the pandemic. Um, but yeah, this is part of uh, being a teacher in our alumni community, you'll get access to these webinars live. The recordings we are, you encur are encouraged to share with anyone. Um, but we are also always looking for more presenters. So if you want to be like Ben, if you have an idea that you want to present on or you have a topic that you'd be interested in us trying to find a presenter on, um, do let us know. Again, you can reach us for any of these fellowships, any questions at fellowshipawards at earthwatch.org. Um, and yeah, I think with that, that brings us to the end of the webinar. Thank you all again for joining and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, evening, wherever you might be joining from. Thank you. Thank you.